I've got some animation in this program tonight. Uh, hopefully that will add to its uh, uh, appeal to you. Um, I've entitled it Moss Island and Kilbuck, A Tale of Two Mills. But before I ever get to Kilbuck and uh, Moss Island, I'm going to kind of give you a history of the mills in this county, uh, of which there were many of them. And something that maybe you've never thought about, but the mills in this county served two purposes. One, they were the first industry in this county. This county's had lots of industry over the years. But if you stop and think about it, the mills were the very first industry that we ever had. And the second thing, and you probably won't never given this a thought, they were social centers. They were social centers. To give you an example, uh, I read about a man that lived over north of Perkinsville. And he had some uh, grain that he wanted ground. And so he loaded up his wagon and he made his trip from Perkinsville to Pendleton, which took him a day. Took him a day. He then spent a day there while he was waiting his turn to have his grain ground and then another day to come home. Now while he was there, while he was there on the shelf of the mill would have been jugs. <laughs> jugs filled with spirits and one of those jugs would have had his name scribed on it. And so he would come periodically and have his work done and take a sip or two and visit with his neighbors. So they became social centers. So keep that in mind as we go along. Mill operations types in Madison County. We had carting mills which were uh, made wool for spinning. We had sawmills where we cut up timber. We had grist mills for grain and corn. Uh, plant, plant, or planting mills that for finished wood, the sawmill of course would cut the rough timber and the planting mill then would cut it into finished wood. Flax, uh, ground fiber, uh, straw and seeds into flax for linen, yard and woven fa fabrics. Carding mills. The uh, Broadbent Woolen Factory was in Richland Township on Kilbuck Creek, built 1846. It was three stories. 150 spindles in one loom, and it could, it could uh, generate 75 pounds of wool a day. That's a lot of wool, 75 pounds. The Robert Adams Woolen Factory, also in Richland Township on Kilbuck, a little bit below where Little and Big Kilbuck unite on Alexandria Pike, about two and a half miles from Anderson, was built in 1835. It was enlarged in 1848 and it processed 120 pounds of wool per day. It had 240 spindles in one loom. Now if you're wondering what a carding mill looked like, the raw product, the wool would be fed here and it would go through these series of wheels that would perform different operations to bring it out with the finished product here. The mill then of course was powered by water flowing into a, a tub wheel, which we'll talk about that a little bit later on. But that's kind of the basic operation of a carting mill. Sawmills. <clears throat> the Luke and Steam Sawmill on Fall Creek Township on Lick Creek built uh, 1852 and it was also a sash mill, made sash there. Florida Station had one in 1867. Uh, they could uh, process 4,000 feet of lumber per day. In New Columbus, uh, one built in 1835 on Fall <laughs> Creek. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Markoville, built 1870, could handle 3,000 feet of lumber per day. Summitville, 1871, 4,000 feet of lumber per day. Also in Summitville in 1873, there was one, uh, one, at one mile northeast of Summitville. In Frankton, in 1871, one a short distance northeast of town, 5,000 feet of lumber per day. These were not all powered by moving water. In the beginning they were, but as time went along and man learned how to harness steam and make steam do the work of the machinery, then you had 
steam powered mills and those mills could be placed wherever. But in the beginning, the mills had to be along flowing water in order for them to operate. Perkins Mill, built 1871, northwest part of town, 5,000 feet of lumber per day. And he advertised there that he shipped his lumber to Boston and San Francisco. The planting mill. Alexandria, built 1872, it was two stories south of the railroad on State Road 9, only one of its kind in the northern part of the county. In Pendleton, built 1872, a short distance below the falls on the south bank of the creek, it was the only mill of its kind in the southern part of Madison County. Anderson, built 1868, two stories southeast corner of 6th and Meridian, 1874, purchased by Nathan and Nelson Armstrong. If you go to 6th and Meridian today, to the apartments there, and there's a sign out in front, what's the name of those apartments? Armstrong, Armstrong Apartments. Anderson also had the Hoosier Mill built 1867. It was a two-story on the east side of Main, north of 6th Street. A sawmill. The New Columbus Sawmill. In 1835, Bailey Jackson began the erection of a sawmill on the bank of Fall Creek at New Columbus, but abandoned it before completion. The site was subsequently purchased by James Pedden, and the mill was completed by him in 1843. That mill was located where I show you the arrow. The gentleman that lives in this house, which is the Gilmore house, came in here one day and said to me, I understand you're doing some history uh, research on this area. I said, yes, I am. He said, would you like to come over to the house and see my house? And I said, sure. So we went in and he showed me all through the Gilmore house. And then he said to me, would you like to see where the mill and the, or the, where the mill was and the mill race in out behind my property? I said absolutely. So we took a walk, and that's the mill race that's behind his property that fed off of Fall Creek at New Columbus. The mill race being this depression in the ground mm -hmm. right here. Grist mills. Andrew Jackson, now not the president had one uh, on Myers Ford on the White River in 1832, Frederick Brinenberg northwest of Chesterfield on the White River 1838, the first national grist mill at Pendleton on Fall Creek built 1848, it was three stories a half mile southwest of Pendleton south of State Road 38. In Perkinsville built 1859 a four story mill, the first mill in 1826, the second in 1835, ships flour to Philadelphia and Baltimore, ran year-round, and it was uh, operated by a dam on the White River, which I'll show you that dam. Summitville built 1872 stories, it was steam. In Franklin built 1859, three stories, south part of town near the railroad, 40 barrels of flour per day it could turn out. <coughs> At Chesterfield, a grist mill and sawmill a short distance northeast of town on Mill Creek. A grist mill built in 1824 by a massive makepiece enlarged to three stories. Power supplied by Mill Creek, which turns a 20-foot overshot mill or wheel. Sawmill adjoins uh, uh, built circa 1870, and it turns it out 3,000 feet of lumber per day, and I have a photograph of that. In Anderson, the Dixon's Mill, built 1874, three stories, 75 barrels of flour per day, located on the west side of Meridian, north of the Bell Fountain Railroad. In 1878, a man by the name of Henderson bought that mill and changed it to the Henderson Mill. The, in Anderson also was the Germana Mill, converted from a warehouse to a mill in 1868. It, it produced 50 barrels of flour per day. It was two stories in height, located near the Cincinnati-Chicago Railroad Depot. In 1888, Wellington bought it, became the Wellington Mills, and then in 1900, the Slack Brothers flowering mill went into operation there. In Chesterfield, built 1850, a three-story mill, 75 barrels of flour per day, located south of Chesterfield, near the Bell Fountain Railroad. Many of you probably remember that old mill that sat on State Road 67, right there across from Gar Nursery. Alexandria, built 1862, 63, it, uh, second best mill in the county. I don't know who went around and raided mills. <laughs> I really don't, but somebody said it was the second best mill. It was four stories in height, uh, 120 barrels of flour per day, so that's pretty good output. 
located in the south part of Alexandria near the railroad. Now this is the location of the Andrew Jackson Mill. It was located at Myers Ford, and maybe some of you saw this in Sunday's paper, where I was talking about the Myers Ford, not Andrew Jackson's Mill, but you can see the bedrock for the Ford that used to go clear across the river here. When the Army Corps of Engineers came through and cleaned up this river years ago, they busted all that up, but they left this up near the bank. But that was the Ford, the Myers Ford. The mill then sat about where I'm standing from that fire, from the uh, Ford. This is uh, not the Perkinsville Mill. It is what the Perkinsville Mill, how it would have operated. What I'm trying to show you here is that they dammed up White River and then made a a mill race to take the uh, water from this pond into the mill to turn the wheel and then you had a tail race. The front part was the mill race, the back part was the tail race. And then the water would return to the White River. This is probably one of the most remarkable things in our county, I think. This, folks, is a dam. It's still there. Can you see the sharpened sticks? Okay, imagine, if you will, in 1835, a man by the name of William Parkins, who Perkinsville is named for, clerical heir, first time in history. <laughs> imagine, if you will, that he sharpened these sticks, he and his boys, drove them into the bed of the river, they're standing up like this, a whole row across the river, and then they filled it with all of these stones. And you can see today that the bed of stones is still pretty much there because look how the ripple in the, of the water after the fall over the... That was built in 1835, 181 years ago, and it's still there. Today... Boaters coming down in power boats, and I've stood there and watched them, they slow way down. And there's an opening here where they can get through. If they don't catch that opening just right, it flips the motor up on the back of their boat. A grist mill. This is the one probably we're most familiar with, and probably in if you've traveled around any, you've seen grist mills. Again, the water supply turning the mill, turning the gears. The grain would be poured in from the top. You had a two stones. You had the bed stone and the runner stone. The bed stone was grooves cut into it, which would then eventually allow the grain to make its way out in, after it was ground into meal. I'll show, you, I'll show you some real stones here in a little bit. But that was the traditional grist mill. Those were all through the county, as I've shown you already. <coughs> Flax mills. Pendleton had one in 1869, a half mile southeast of town, immediately north of the fairgrounds. Um, uses straw fiber to make linen yard for thread or woven fabrics. In Anderson, built in 1871, located near the Catholic Cemetery, the first grade used for gunny bags and the second grade for <coughs> upholstering. So you had different grades of the flax. Now where's the Catholic Cemetery? It's St. Mary's Cemetery on Brown Street across from St. Vincent's Hospital. <laughs> a textile mill, this would be a typical operation. The machine that did the work was uh, housed in a, uh, a box here, but the, the gears and all of the apparatus that drove it, that's how it worked. The Cataract Mills of Pendleton. The first mill, 1821, William McCartney, small log uh, corn mill. The third owner, James Irish, built a much larger mill on the south side of Fall Creek. Woolen mill erected by Samuel Irish on the north side of the creek just below the falls. It burned June 1, 1865. The 1865 stone and brick building built uh, a woolen factory until 1870 when converted to a grist mill. Four stories in height, 150 barrels of flour per day, supplied by Fall Creek uh, unless low water when steam was used, they shipped to New York, Cleveland, Boston, and to Indianapolis. The best mill in the county. Again, I don't know who did that. 
I'll bet you, though, it was some people from Pendleton that came up with that. <laughs> people from Pendleton here tonight. Adjoining a few yards east is a sawmill and a heading factory. The Huntsville Mills, uh, first mill replaced in 1830 uh, by a three-story mill attached was an oil and sawmill and woolen factory, all destroyed by fire in 1848. The four-story grist mill built uh, saw mill a few rods east, circa 1850. Mr. B.F. Amon acquired in 1872. His name is synonymous with mills in South Madison County. Supplied by Fall Creek through a mill race and a turbine wheel. This is the mill at Alexandria, built 1862-1863. This is the makepiece mill in Chesterfield. This is the Dixon and later the Henderson Grist Mill in, in Anderson. This is a Germana and Wellington Grist Mill. Big operations. Big operations. Now, locate this for you. Here's Fifth Street. Here's Alexandria Pike, and this is the old Pennsylvania Railroad. North, north, uh, North Main. The mill sat here. Today it's, um, is it Boots that has a casket manufacturing company? That's the site. But you notice an elevator and feed mill here, a sawmill here, all that industry in that end of town. That's a picture of uh, G.D. Shaw. That's his son, Dad. Dad got burned up in a fire in this building. But that's the boy, arrow drawn to him right here. Amon's Mill, this is the one down at Huntsville, 1850. Today, there's a house built right on the site of this mill. And if you're really nice to the people that live there, they'll let you see the mill race that comes into their beneath their house. Probably a lot of you remember the Wellington Mills. You don't remember it as that, you remember it as the Farm Bureau Co-op building on Central Avenue, right? Yep, yeah. yeah, that's it. Picture here of uh, Fall Creek in Pendleton showing you the uh, how the creek is dammed up. That's a picture taken, has to be sometime 1850, 1860, 1870s. Somewhere in that 20 year period this photograph was taken because that was built in the winter of 1850, 1851 to carry the railroad across Fall Creek. Falls Park looks a lot different today than it did then. Kind of like today, isn't it? This is the old Pendleton Woolen Factory and Grist Mill built in 1865 to replace the one that burned. It's across the falls. Look how frozen the falls are. You see this man right here? He's got a stick in his hand. What do you think he's doing? He's breaking up the ice to keep the water flowing to the mill. If the mill race freezes over, these folks go home without pay, I'm sure. Pardon me? Up on the hill, is that the house that's up there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No kidding. That house is still there. Yeah. Yeah. That's a neat picture. Outside the Pendleton Historical Museum, of which I'm a proud member, they have these first for the uh, area. But one of them I call your attention to is the Woolen and Flour and Sawmill, erected here in 1825. And then the, uh, what was it, the first uh, lumber was sawed here for the first courthouse in Indianapolis. It was sawn there, and then it was floated down Fall Creek to Indianapolis. That's how they got it there. Two Madison County mills achieved a level of notoriety, and this is their story. 
the Moss Island Mill. The Moss Island Mill, show hands, how many remember about where the Moss Island Mill was located? Sure you do. The arrow points to it here on White River, Romine Road, Moss Island Road. Early pictures of the Moss Island Mill. The, um, the way the mill operated, there was a mill race that came in from here and the water could be diverted into the mill and it would drop down on the turbines that were here. And the turbines spun and drove the machinery. When they didn't want that water to be used to power them, then they would shut the gates and let the water come off of here. That's why you see that. Now I'll show you with a photograph a much better illustration of that. This is another picture of the Moss Island Mill and this was the old toll road turnpike that ran from Anderson to Perkinsville. And this man here was a toll gatekeeper and for a nickel he'd let you pass. Wasn't that a corduroy road? It was a gravel road. It may have later been corduroy, but to begin with they were all gravel, sir. Yes. Arrow points to the Moss Island and shows you the mill. A blow up of that. What I wanted to show you was there was actually an island. There was actually an island called Moss Island. This is the main channel of the river and this would have been the mill race that went around this side of the island to bring the water into the mill. Was that man made? Yes it was. Yes it was. Yes it was. And it was quite a mill race. I got a great photograph of it. This tugs at my heartstrings. One of my most favorite people in all the world did that for me, Dick Bowman. He wanted to he he wanted to do something to help me when I was putting this together. This is how long this program has been under wraps. This is the first time I've ever done it. But he he took what I told him as to how it looked, and he did this for me, and I'm really, really pleased to to have that. He did a great job. Yes, he did. Everything Dick Bowman did was good. The mill history. The first mill was built in 1836. <coughs> Moss Island cre uh, created by the mill race known as Snelson's. That was the name of the race. And it was about 20 feet wide. The dam was constructed above the entrance to the race. The river's flow slowed by the dam, causing a pool of water called slack water. With the river flow slowed by the dam, the water entering the race flowed faster. That was the theory. Otherwise, you could just use the fast-moving water of the river to power the mill. But the river would be sluggish at times. So if you dam it and you create a big pool of water and then you put a gate on that and you open that gate, the water comes through at a much faster rate and powers your machinery. That's, in theory, how a mill operated. The increased water flow supplied the power. Now the dam. Two picture postcards. Survive of the dam at Moss Island. You could see it there. That's Moss Island. The mills builder, Joseph Mullinex, selected the site due to its proximity to the planned northern extension of the Central Canal from Indianapolis with its connections through the Wabash and Erie Canal to Lake Erie, the Lake Erie Canal, or the Erie Canal, and then on to New York City. Or the Central Canal's southern extension to reach Evansville on the High River and open up the port of New Orleans. Mr. Mullinex had a great idea. He was obviously a good businessman because he reasoned if he placed his mill where he placed it, across the river, the Central Canal was to pass. Now I can grind my mill, and uh, grind, grind the uh, grain into meal, and I can ship it on boats on that canal, and it can go up the canal to Toledo, Lake Erie, into Lake Erie, over to Buffalo, New York, 
into the Erie Canal at Buffalo, New York, across New York State to Albany, New York, on the uh, Hudson River, down the Hudson River, and you're in New York City. Or you could go south to Evansville, dump into the Ohio River, follow the Ohio River to the Mississippi, and the Mississippi to New Orleans. He picked a good spot. And this illustrates where he placed his mill. And today there are canal remnants in this area that I've pointed to here. The canal was to pass in front there, but as we know from other programs I've done, the canal failed because of a financial failure in the state. These were the canals that were to operate in Indiana. And Mr. Molnex's mill would have been right here in Madison County. And you could see the connections that he would have had. <coughs> also, if when the Whitewater Canal, all of you have been to Metamora and you've seen the Whitewater Canal, well, that eventually was planned to go all the way up to Muncie. And in Muncie then, there was to be a connector branch to Anderson. That would have made Anderson the crossroads of Indiana for its time, but that didn't happen. But that was the plan. The new owners, the canal failure as a result of the panic of 1837, Mullinex failed to pay his property taxes, I found, and so it was sold, sold at a sheriff's sale. The new owners, Lloyd Brown and Frank Davis, took possession January 18, 1845, the mill uh, known as both Brown's Mill and Davis Mill. The mill changed hands several times in a short span of years. John and Ann Moss purchased the uh, two-acre property. 1867, they opened the Moss Island Flowering Mill. James Moss was the son of John and Ann and owned the property for many years. Another son, William, brought the mill, bought the mill for $10,000 shortly before his death. In 1873, that mill was destroyed by fire and is so common, people didn't carry insurance. That's so common. 1875, Samuel Moss and another son built a three-story mill on the site of the old one. Three sets of millstones capable of making 72, 75 barrels of flour every 24 hours in 1875. The large stones ground the farmer's corn into meal, his wheat, oats, and barley into flour. Decline. Many of the 20 plus owners operated a sawmill at the site regularly during its history. Some made money while others lost. The improved machinery in the latter part of the 19th century killed the merchants' mills. They could do all of that work so much faster, so much more efficient. There was no railroad nearby. You see, the canals failed. So he had no outlet. He had no outlet. So he ended up just cutting timber for the local people and grinding <laughs> mill for the local farmers' needs, but they couldn't ship it anywhere. Didn't have any way to get it out. Small neighborhood uh, grinding only source of income. I found this in the papers, uh, August 18th, 1930, issue of the Anderson Daily Bulletin. Stayed a few weeks previous, a part of the mill overhanging the mill race had fallen into the river. In 1932, the paper reported that until recent years, the mill continued to grind feed, but at the present lies idle in a rather dilapidated condition. In 1935, the mill was dismantled. The iron under buckets, underwater buckets were turned over to the Boy Scouts and salvaged the scrap during World War II. We had a big scrap drive in our county in October of 1942. These are the names that I've been able to find of the 20 people who owned the Moss Island Mill. A small community flourished about the site uh, for a time. It was called Toad Level. <laughs> Toad Level. Now you can tell people, I'm from Toad Level. <laughs> I'm from Toad Level. Gradually, Moss Island came to embrace all the surrounding area. <coughs> In later years, the area became popular swimming, fishing, and a picnic spot. And yes, in 1910, gypsies. In the early horse and buggy days, travelers desiring to take the road to Anderson had to pay a toll of five cents at the gatehouse, 
located next to the mill for the privilege of fording the tail race back of the mill. The tail race is the downstream part of the mill race where the impounded part of the water re-enters the river. There the water was not as swift and one could cross to the island and then over the dam to the other side of the river. Now I got this picture. This is uh, Sherry Ballinger in her younger days posing okay. on the... Uh, <laughs> yes, that's right. Isn't that nice? In her younger days. No, I, if Marilyn Marsh were here, that would be Marilyn Marsh, but <laughs> Marilyn's not here. But you can see the dam across the river. And I've got other pictures that I didn't bring, but there's, there's family sitting here fishing. The first bridge over the river at Moss Island was built in 1869. It was built as a result of the Turnpike Company being formed in 1868 to run a turnpike from Anderson to Perkinsville. We well, had to cross the river. You needed a bridge. You couldn't, you couldn't count on that ford because when the water's up, you can't cross the ford. So you cross the bridge. I'll show you the bridge. The second bridge came along in 1910. Both were bowstring style. In 1926 was the third bridge, concrete, and most of us in this room remember that bridge. In 1986, that bridge was closed. Remember how narrow that bridge was? School buses used to go on there. School buses, yeah. And in 1990, it's removed. Now, here's the photograph that I'm probably more excited about than anything. This photograph, I am certain, was taken in 1869 when the bridge opened. Why else would all of those people be out at the bridge, sitting along the wall, standing up here on the bridge, and a photographer from Anderson, who was active in this area in 1871, he's out there with his wagon, his photography wagon. What on earth he's standing on, I don't know unless he was an awfully tall man, but he's taking that picture. That, folks, I think is the oldest picture that I know of in Madison County, 1869, I'm sure it is, because this bridge would have been open that year. That would have been an occasion for a photographer to go out there and take the picture. Otherwise, why would you go? Why would you go? Now notice, notice this is North Shore Boulevard today. So we're looking north, we're looking north, so to orient you, North Shore Boulevard, and notice the difference in the height of the bowstrings, the spans. The center span over the river is much higher, and the span here is much lower because the danger is not as great, I guess, of falling in. I'm just, uh, look at the daredevil here, he's standing like this, see? Yeah. Gust, <laughs> gust of wind comes along, guess where he's going. <laughs> but uh, this guy's kind of land looks like maybe on an elbow. Neat picture, neat picture. Now, remember I showed you the difference in the height? Well, that's the, that's the 1869 version. Well, in 1910, they had to lengthen, they had to lengthen the bridge. And this is the 1910 version. And notice, again, you have the shorter span, but they're about the same height. So it's two different bridges. And that's the 1910 bridge. Isn't that neat, go to that? Isn't that neat? And that's Moss Island in the distance. Yes, I heard somebody say it, because this photograph is taken on the east side of the bridge facing west, and the buggy is headed from north to south. North to south. Neat picture. Well, does that bring back memories to anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Used to play around that bridge a lot when I was a kid. Used to like to walk over the, on the railing there. Wouldn't do that today. Couldn't do it today. Couldn't do it today. That's the Moss Island Mill, the second one, built in 1875. I told you the first one burned. And you remember I told you how the water 
could either enter or dump. Take a look at this. This is the water coming in, a free fall, and then an exit back to the river. And I got even a better picture. Here it's coming in, and the drop. And these are the gates that they would open to let it in or close to divert, divert the water. There were two types of wheel, mill wheel operations the vertical and horizontal. The vertical you had an overshot, a breast, and an undershot, and the horizontal was a tub or a turbine. Now, how did they operate? That's the overshot. Blue, can you see all right? Okay. Yep. Which was most efficient? Which was the most efficient? I don't know that one was any more efficient than the other. I really Why don't. They build three types because of uh, the, where the, how the water entered. A breast <coughs> wheel. And an undershot. This is the tub wheel. These, these were advancements. <coughs> and the Kilbuck mill, which we'll talk about next, had a tub wheel. What were the Colors. I mean, was that iron or what? Yes, I'll show you. Here they are. Okay. Here they are. This is the fall of the water. You usually needed about seven foot of fall to generate enough fall to power the wheel to turn <coughs> to turn the shaft to operate the machinery. So you needed about seven, and that generated so many horsepower. <coughs> Excuse me. We'll talk about that. It was replaced by the turbine wheel, which was much more efficient. That came along as an invention in 1862, and it doubled the flour production because you could get twice the amount of horsepower out of the same volume of water. This is a turbine wheel that's seen better days, but you can see with, with that, they did away with all other kind of mill wheels. This was a huge advancement. Now, we talked about the millstones. I told you that the grain would be fed in here and would make its way out. And as this was turning, this was turning over, grinding all of that grain into a fine meal. And once it was in that state, then it would trickle its way out the burrs and it would be collected. Moss Island scenes. Bruce, this addresses your question. But first, this is the only photograph that I have of Mr. Snelson's 20-foot wide mill race. I don't know who the lady is in the, uh, in the canoe, but she's in the mill race, making her way to the Moss Island mill. Picture taken in 1926 shows the gas pumps that were there. The man who operated the gas pumps lived over here. And here's the Moss Island Mill, 1926. And there you are. I may remember Joe Hartman's cider mill. Very, very popular place to go get apples and cider. That's the site of the Moss Island Mill. I took this photograph in September of 2009. Uh, I guess I've had this thing under wraps for that long. Um, but this was where the mill was located uh, all through this area. This is Romine Road. Out back, now, for my wife's purposes, I did go up and knock on the door because I wanted to walk around back and take pictures. See, she always cautions me don't go on private property without permission. Well, I remember that about half the time and half the time I don't. But I did knock that day. That truck was there, but nobody answered. So I proceeded behind the property 
to show you this is where they dumped what was left of the Moss Island Mill when they tore it down. And that's the debris field behind the old Moss Island Mill. And that is the bridge abutment for that 1869 Moss Island Bridge. Still there. And that's Moss Island today. You see, the Army Corps of Engineers came through there years ago and removed it to allow better water flow during high periods of water, during periods of high water. But as we all know, Mother Nature generally wins when it comes to a battle with man, does she not? She's reclaiming the Moss Island. She's rebuilding it in the river in the same spot that it once was. This is what I can find when I walked along down there. This is what's left of that old dam you saw the lady sitting on. That's, that's all that's left of it. <coughs> and the island. Moss Cemetery is not far away. Kilbuck Mill. Kilbuck Mill, the arrow points to its location. To orient you, for those who may not know, this is Frisch's on Broadway. Frisch's on Broadway. Here's Grand Avenue. Here's Broadway. Here's Grand Avenue going over and it becomes Indiana Avenue. And that site there, yes? That's the upholstery, what would be the upholstery shop now? Yes, it is. It's called Maxwell's Trim Shop. Yeah. Maxwell's Trim Shop. These are picture postcards showing you the mill. The one on the right was postmarked 1910. In 1860, William Sparks built a single-story sawmill. That year, he uh, also hand-dug a mill race from Kilbuck Creek to the mill and then on to White River. The <coughs> mill race measured 2,000 feet. He dug it by hand, 2,000 feet, because he wanted his supply to come from Kilbuck Creek. In 1862, he formed a partnership with Mr. A. Sedell and built a grist mill next to the sawmill. The frame construction measured 36 by 40 feet. It was supported by stone pillars. It was four floors, including the basement. It had a slate roof. The millstones imported from France, now here we go, $1,500 each, 1862. I don't have one of those things that tells you what that's worth today, but that's a whole lot more money today, 15. So that, that's how much came from France. Yes, they did. Sparks and Sedell operated the two mills until 1867 when they sold it to a man by the name of Clifford. In January of 68, uh, he sold half of his interest to John Hall, and later that year, Hall buys out the rest of Mr. Clifford's interest. In 1868, a series of improvements began. A 48-inch American turbine wheel was installed in the basement, furnishing 20 horsepower. In 1862, a 60-inch and 32-inch top saw installed, uh, which increased capacity by about two-thirds, creating a maximum capacity of 2,000 feet of hardwood and 3,000 feet of softwood per day. That was a going operation. In 1862, the grist mill had three pair of stones grinding. What did we say? $1,500 for one? Add three pair, multiply 1,500 by six. Two were four foot and one was three foot in, in uh, diameter. Three American turbine wheels, two 42-inch and one 36-incher. Combined power under head or waterfall of seven feet was 37 horsepower, doubling the previous horsepower. See how much more they could get done with those wheels. The maximum capacity per year was 60,000 bushels of grain came out of the Kilbuck Mill. 60,000 bushels a year. 
Flour was sold under the name of Kilbuck Flour. In 1907, John Goring sells the mill to the Union Traction Company. UTC wanted the dam on Kilbuck Creek to increase the water supply used to operate the boilers at their power plant. You see, the mill's operations had fallen way off. Modern technology had, had replaced it. It was really of no use anymore. But over on Kilbuck Creek was this dam, and the mill race was still there. Well, the Union Traction Company built its power plant where Brown's Bowling Alley is today on Broadway. Well, those big turbines and generators in there had to be cooled to operate efficiently because they ran 24 hours a day. So they diverted the water from Kilbuck Creek using the dam and brought it over to cool those machinery and then they channeled it back into Kilbuck Creek. The water going back to Kilbuck Creek, Bruce knows what I'm going to say, was so warm, so warm from the machinery that Kilbuck Creek at the place where the dam was, was a popular swimming hole every New Year's Day. <laughs> every New Year's Day. Now, the water that came back to the creek had a coating of minerals in it. And if you swam in it, Cherry, you would come out with this yellow stain on your skin and your clothes. And so mothers would tell their children, don't go over there and swim or you'll contract jaundice. <laughs> Forty-seven years of mill operation ends. In the 1940s, Charles Leonard buys the five-acre tract of land, including the mill, which was torn down in the late 1940s. How many remember Mr. Leonard's drive-in? During the time, the millstones were purchased and moved to a museum in southern Indiana. That's all I could find. I couldn't find the name of the museum. I would love to know what museum in southern Indiana has them. 12-inch diameter solid steel shaft lies a foot below the floor of Maxwell's trim shop and extends most of the shop's width. I went out and knocked on the door of Maxwell's trim shop. Walked in and introduced myself. And the men were in there working and the owner said, can I help you? And I said, yes. I said, is there any part of this shop where you are today that is part of the old Killbuck Mill? And he said, yes, yes. We had to do some remodeling here a few years ago. And when we did, we had to dig up the floor to do what we wanted to do. And in the floor was this solid steel shaft about a foot below the floor. I said, what did you do with it? He said, I just covered it back up. <laughs> just covered it back up. Showing you the mill. And here's the mill race. Okay, and that's, that's the hand dug mill race. That's the 2,000 foot hand dug mill race. And then it went over and it dumped out here. Well, I can take you to the beginning of it, but because all of this area became fill when they built the Broadway Bridge in 1937, they hauled all the dirt from behind Ted Vincent's family's farm and filled all of that in so the, the race is gone except you can, I'll show you here in just a moment, the mouth. the mouth of it, and then I can show you, I've walked all of this and that's still there. But it's dry, I mean, obviously no water's flowing in, it's just, just the... It's dry except. All right. Again, the picture of the mill, or the location of the mill, present day. This is the site of the mill race dam on Kilbuck. This is the mouth of the mill race. If you're wondering where this is, this is the back of Prairie Farms. Okay, the back corner of Prairie Farms. Okay. Okay. The gentleman who asked about where the, was this gentleman, is that, have you seen this one? Okay. Did you know that's what that was? Okay. This was 
part of the original concrete dam that went across the river. I was curious. How high was that dam? Well, probably in your lifetime, the dam was still there, but certainly it was there in the lifetime of a very good friend of Gerald Jones and I. He's gone now, but he took me out there one day to show me where, as a boy, he used to play on the dam and fish and swim and whatever boys do. And I said to him, I said, Dick, Show me about how high that dam was, as you remember it. And then I took this picture. That is Dick Moberly, who many of you will recognize and remember. An awfully good friend to, to Gerald and I. This is immediately behind uh, the, well, I'm actually, I'm underneath the old Pennsylvania Railroad trestle. trestle That's road what's road. casting the shadow here. And so that's going to become a walkway now, part of the park. And this begins the tail race as it makes its way to the river. And there's water in it, Sam, but it's, it's backwater and it's rain. You only go down there in the spring. You don't go down there any other time of the year because it's the brambles and everything else, you'll, they'll just cut you up and you can't see anything. But I took these pictures as that tail race makes its way to the river. And here it is, getting ready to dump into the river. Interesting point that I want to bring up to you, and that is seen in this photograph. Photograph on the right is the bridge abutments for the Delaware Bridge, <coughs> built in 1904. But I point your, direct your attention to I'm standing where the mill race emptied. And look at this cut. Where this bridge was, and at one time there was a dam right here, a stone dam. The purpose of that dam was to back the water up so that they could route it into the central canal. That never came to be, but that's what you're looking at there. That's what you're looking at. Now, Maxwell's trim shop. When I uh, was out there visiting with him, I said to him, I, I asked him, you know, he told me about the shaft and the floor. I said, is that it? And he says, no. He says, I got something else. He says, I wish I could do something about it. And I said, what is it? Well, he says, come on outside. So we went outside. And he showed me this piece of concrete. He says, that's part of the old mill. He says, it's got nothing to do with my business. <coughs> So I took a picture of it. Dandelions. Don't you like to see dandelions in January? <laughs> My mailbox in December had a dandelion underneath it. Anyway, he said, I decided the boys, being the guys that work for him, we'd dig that out and get it out of there. <laughs> he said, we quit digging at 14 feet. <laughs> We quit digging at 14 feet and just filled it back in. He said, I knew then I was on my way to China. <laughs> now, I think, oh, this shows you, this shows you the, how the, uh, here's Frisch's. This shows you how that ground was all, all fill. That's all fill to make the Broadway Bridge in 1937. But you can see I'm standing at level for the Killbuck Mill. And a mill race came in through here. That's how much fill was added to that area. What about the dam that's right there behind Frisch's? The dam behind Frisch's on Killbuck? Right. I don't know its story, but I, I've looked at that, sir, and I think the reason that it's there is this. Killbuck Mill, or Killbuck Creek comes down from the north and it makes a big bend there, does it not? Well, I'm sure in periods of high water before that dam was there to create a slack water to kind of slow that flow down, that water went shooting across Grand Avenue and washed out Grand Avenue. Now, not being an engineer, I think I'm probably pretty close to why that is there. If somebody knows differently, I'd like to... 
Yeah, yeah. I've got some geese I'd like to give it. This shows you, again, the, the, the wall or whatever that was, and I think it's part of the loading dock. I think it's part of the loading dock, but I don't know. I don't know. It'll probably be one of those questions that I'll never be able to answer. There's a picture of the mill. There from 1862 to 1947. Long time. These are some old newspaper clippings, and I apologize for the quality of them. But what I wanted to point out to you was that the mill race came in and dumped here at what would be the northwest corner of the building. Dumped straight down seven feet to hit one of those tub wheels. And then it exited the building here, the flow of water did, and you've seen the tail race. That's how it operated. That's a picture taken April 10th, 1936, and you can see how the Union Traction Company was advertising Kilbuck Mills Travel Ship Union Traction. They used it for storage. 1936, you see the Pennsylvania Railroad Bridge in the background, and you see the Delaware Street Bridge behind that, don't you? As many of you know, in 1937, we had a pretty good flood here in Anderson, didn't we? Well, the flood got the Kilbuck Mill. And the last photograph of the Kilbuck Mill was taken post-World War II. And, and the couple that gave me the picture are now well along in years. But that's who gave me the photograph. I went to their home. They live on Broadway, north of the uh, north of Vineyard. Quite an impressive history we've had in mills. Now, my work's not done. My work is not done. Stoltz Mill, you can see it labeled Anderson, Indiana. I have no idea. I'm still looking for Stoltz Mill. Don Stoltz brought it in to me. He's a quasi-historian at Anderson University. He brought it in. He says, can you tell this is in my family? But I don't know where it was. It's quite old because look at the wheel. I don't know where it was. This body of water is certainly not White River. It may be Little Kilbuck. I don't know. Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. Well, in Indiana today, there are numbers of mills still around that you can visit. I'm sure that uh, many of you have been. Is this, this is Mansfield, I think, uh, down in Park County? Uh, lots of mills to see in, in the state. There's a list of the mills that you can go visit in Indiana. Um, some of us here in the Historical Society visited the Metamora Mill on our bus trip, thanks to, to Milt. Uh, I know some of you have been over to the Rock uh, Park County Festival in the fall, Spring Mill. But that's the mills that are still can be seen in Indiana today. Thank you.